This is the Top Form Podcast with your host, me, J.R. Watkiss. I interview people from all over the world who are at the top of their game in music, film, politics, sports, and business. In their own words, you will hear how they are changing the way we think, the way we play, and the way we do business whilst operating from their top form so tune in every week to listen who will be my special guest to tell us about their journey as a top performer right here on the top form podcast wherever you listen to podcasts Welcome to season two of the Top Form Podcast. My name is Jara Watkiss, and as promised, we have a lovely show lineup for you. My first guest kicking off season two is no other than Damien Junigong Marley. Damien Marley joined me from his Miami home where I was in Jamaica and he was in Miami. We had a lovely conversation about entertainment, reggae music, Bujubantan, the Welcome to Jamra cruise that it has already been sold out for 2019 and he's thinking about 2020 already. He gave advice on the Grammys and how artists should perceive the Grammys and how artists might develop themselves and become better in this streaming world. It was an exciting interview. Um, I certainly enjoyed it and it was a pleasure having Damien Junagang Marley as a special guest on the Top Form podcast. So without much further ado, I'm going right into the interview with Damien Junagong Marley, the son, the youngest son of Bob Marley, the legend of reggae, right here on the Top Form Podcast. Greetings, my brethren. All gone. Yes, brother. You can hear me? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. It's a pleasure to hear your voice. Where's the man? Where's the man in the world right now? Miami at the moment. Miami, my place, my place. Big up. This is the Top yeah. Form Podcast. And we're streaming worldwide on Spotify, iTunes, all the top platforms in the world we're streaming right now. So it's a pleasure to have you, Mr. Marley. Damien Junagong Marley, ladies and gentlemen. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. I want to start from the beginning because I have been wanting to interview you for a long time. And I know we don't have a lot of time, but I want to start with how you entered the music business and give the, especially young people who are into reggae now and, and, and some may not even be into reggae, they're into dancehall and some other things. How Junior Gang came onto the scene? Well, um, of course, it goes without saying that my family, you know, has been in the music business even before I was born. You know what I mean? So I grew up around my brothers and sisters doing music and, of, of course, my father and these things. Um, but really, for me, it, it kind of started as being a fan, especially of dance and music. You know, 80s dance and music is the first music that I started to buy for myself. And because of imitating people who I was a fan of was how I started to want to perform for myself. You know what I mean? This would be people like... Tiger, Peter Metro, Ninja Man, Shabarang, Super Cat, you know, that, that kind of era of artists. Um, so, you know, I used to, like I said, I used to listen to their music and wanted to be like them. And then, um, you know, we started a group with a friend, one of my childhood friends who I grew up with, who is the son of Cat Core from Third World. His name is Shia Core. And we started a group together called The Shepherds. So we started doing shows in Kingston. Well, like Mother's Day events and, you know, children's birthday party and, you know, so forth. Until until we ended up, you know, gaining enough momentum to, to open up with Reggae Sunsplash when Sunsplash was still going on. We opened up, you know, Sunsplash. So that's really how my entrance into the music business is, you know, was. Yeah, you mentioned Reggae Sunsplash. There are talks about Sunsplash coming back and other reggae shows and you have the welcome to jam rock cruise that is is making big waves um overseas and locally because the cruise that move from miami come to jamaica um what is your take on the live music culture for reggae music and where do you see it going and 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 do you admire where it's coming from where it is and where it's going and where what's your opinion on it well um Hopefully we have. Hopefully there will be more events. You know, over the years a lot of our annual events have gone away because of lack of sponsorship or for whatever reason. So hopefully we'll we'll have some more annual events because it's a great way to experience the music. 
for me, like I say again, that was a big part of my inspiration of becoming an artist, you know what I mean? Was when I was a kid, I used to go to like a sunsplash and watch these people perform. So, and, and it's a great, um, it's great for the island, it's great for the culture, it's great for our tourism, and it's great for help, help branding our culture of reggae music. And, and you, mentioned, you mentioned something earlier when you said um, artists and you said reggae artists or even dancehall artists. To me, it's all one in the same still, you know. Because originally dancehall was a place, it was a venue. And whatever music was played in that venue is where you can see dancehall music. And of course, of course, the genre has evolved where you have, you know, original root sound in music compared to where you have now as modern dancehall, where you call dancehall. But it's still I fall under the umbrella of reggae in terms of Jamaican culture, reggae music, you know what I mean? So you don't make a distinction between the two? I believe it's one family. Just just like hip hop, have fast hip hop, slow hip hop, etc. Yeah, it's still hip hop, you know what I mean? So you still have hip hop from the eighties, slick rick and, and those kind of artists, the way I've now which is like trap. So you know what I'm called trap. But it's still it's still all underneath hip hop genre of music, you know what I mean? Yeah, so that makes sense. That that makes a lot yeah. of sense because there was a there's a recent um survey that I did um because I do a, a world music views chart that I curate the streaming numbers in the Caribbean, Dubai, US, UK, um and Canada. And I found that persons are listening to as you said. The, the, the modern version of reggae, which is dancehall, it's the speeded version of it, and not so much the roots. Um, that's in the Caribbean, though. Worldwide, persons are listening to the roots more than the, the, the modern version, which is what we call dancehall. How do you suggest that the roots, man, get some of the market, um, especially the up-and-coming reggae artists, get some of the market that's available for reggae, both locally and internationally? Yeah, let's keep putting out good music. Um and of course I think you have you have to kinda you have to mingle amongst the people, you know what I mean? Collaborate with people, go to the venues, go to the events that you know, you you're trying to reach. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> go to the dance halls. Sometimes even when sometime when I go when I'm in Jamaica and, and I go out in the night time. A lot of the times, I don't see a lot of the roots artists. I see, you know, the dancehall artists going out to the dance and to the events, but I don't see a lot of the roots artists out in, in the streets. You know what I mean? So, you know, to, to be a part of the culture in all different ways will help. You know what I mean? But, again, the most important thing is just putting out good music because still I do feel that we, even in the Caribbean, Caribbean right now, a lot of the young roots acts, their music is highly appreciated. You know what I mean? So... I think there's still a, a resurgence of that energy right now. You you have been one of them who you put out albums. Um, you don't put out an album every year, but you are you're part. You're definitely part of album culture. Do you think albums still have a place in reggae dancehall or is a singles market? Uh, albums still have a place. Albums still have a place. It's always nice to get a body of work and people still listen to albums and are still excited about albums. But I think nowadays, realistically, there's no rules or there's no right way to do it anymore or, or one way to do it. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, nowadays, it's, it's almost like in, in these times, it's almost like the more creative the approach is, the better. You know what I mean? So you're not binded by having to put out an album. You can put out an EP or can just put out four songs. Because people still ex can experience the songs as singles anyhow. You know what I mean? Mm. But, um, but, to put out, but to put out a body of work, is, is, it still means something. And of course, it, it's, if you're promoting an album, you're driving traffic to more songs at once than if you're just promoting a single. You know what I mean? So it helps you in that way too. And, and you, you have been... A serial collaborator. You collaborate with some of the greatest in the world. Um, Jay-Z, most notably, Bam, that took the entire world by storm, and he performed with Jay-Z. What was that experience like, recording with Jay-Z, performing with Jay-Z, and, and what's the relationship like with you and Jigaman? Yeah, it was a good experience, a cool experience. I'm a fan of his music. I've been a fan of his music for years. Um, Met him and had conversations with him a couple of times over the years before ever doing any music with him. You know what I mean? But of course, um, I was honored to 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 
have been considered to be a part of his project. You know what I mean? Of course, like I said, like I said again, I'm a fan of his music and Jay Z is definitely one of the legends of our time when it comes down to modern music. Um, you know, so it was a, it was a great experience. And and bam, um, what did that do for your career? Um, I noticed that you're one of the top streaming artists, definitely in Jamaica. You're among what we call the hundred million club. You're up there with you, Sean Paul, um, Shaggy, Stephen Marley, Taurus Riley. You're up there in the hundred million club streaming catalog. Um, what did Bam specifically do for your career? How did it impact you? I can't really say that Bam specifically did anything notable where I could point to and say, okay, it, it did this or that. You know, I mean, I think just consistently releasing good music is what really does it. Um, and of course, I've had various other collaborations with other great artists over the years that every mickle make a muckle, you know what I mean? So I don't think every, I don't think there's any one thing that you'd point to and say, well, this is it. But I think everything added up is what really makes the, the body of work what it is, you know what I mean? And what about reggae being sold? Do you think reggae music is getting the the reach that it needs to reach to sell the kind of record that it should sell. Um, what, is, what is your take on reggae numbers right now? Well, I think that with streaming, you know, when you talk about sell records, that's really a thing of the past, you know what I mean? I think as the years goes on, I mean, sooner or later, I've been hearing that iTunes is going to close down their music store where you don't buy the singles anymore. It's just going to be strictly streaming. Yeah. You know what I mean? So streaming is really streaming is really the future. And that really opens up a lot of opportunities for reggae music. You know what I mean? Because even even within within the Caribbean, we never traditionally buy albums anyway. You know what I mean? But everybody is now streaming. So you can put out a you can put you can upload something on even for example YouTube. You can upload something on YouTube. And just within the Caribbean you can amass millions of streams let alone start talking about Europe and America and other places. So the streaming has helped to validate our numbers even within our own reggae core market. You understand what I'm saying? And then, of course, you don't need a big machine right now to try to get record physical copies in stores. So a you that is working in Kingston and putting together some music with the, with the click of a button can upload his music for the world to have access to. You know what I mean? And that is going to be a benefit to... to musicians whether in jamaica or wherever you are you know what, I mean? so what you just reasoned is has been part of my reasoning and that's why i started world music views on tvj because i realized the billboard numbers were in the thousands but the streaming numbers um which is a more accurate depiction of how people are consuming the music are in the hundreds of thousands and millions um so are you well, saying Based on what you just keeping, said, that the Billboard chart is irrelevant. No, I'm not saying that at all, because keep in mind, Billboard does consider streaming. So even when you think of our music and say it's a hundred of, of millions, well, if you compare that to a pop record, pop record is in billions. You see what yeah. I'm saying? So it's still relevant because everything is, they still, have a, they still have a system of how they consider, okay, a certain number of, of streams, um, you know, would, would equate to a record sale or re yeah. equate to one of their units on billboard however they you know what i mean but they have a formula so it's so it's still the same formula that they, they use for all genres so it's still relevant even though it's and not, Tidal, it's not huh? yeah no go, go ahead no so even though it's not one record sale per scan or per unit what you're seeing now as it used to be but they still have a, like I said, they still have an equation where they use for all genres. Yeah. So if Tidal is one of the, the platforms that pays the most, and I noticed that you have a, a deal with Tidal. Tell us about that deal, and do you encourage other artists to broker deals such as that? Well, the deal with Tidal that I have, I was approached. Um, this is something, like, for example, like I was saying, I had some conversations with Jay-Z before doing music with him. The, the, the deal with Tidal was one of those conversations where I was approached by his camp and I went and sat down and had a meeting with them. And what they invited me to be a part of is an artist's owner. So basically, they offered me some shares to, to be a part of Tidal and to support Tidal. And then in return, they would have exclusive 
uh, my music exclusively for a certain amount of time. So, for example, if I release a video now, you may notice for the first week or two weeks, it's only on Tidal. So, the, yeah, I so this is that. not nec- right. So this is not necessarily this is not necessarily the typical deal that they would strike with with an artist. They're doing a, a deal now. So I don't I don't know of them really just doing random deals with people. You know what I mean? In this that, is, in that this kind is really of because of your clout as Damian Marley, the, the person who has the impact all over the world. Well, you said that. I didn't say that. But this was an opportunity that presented itself to me, and I was glad for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. Um, do you think, you said streaming is going to take over, do you think there is a space um, for artists to start their own streaming companies? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that. Yeah, I mean, it's possible, um, depending on how much music you have and the bandwidth, because you know, there's a technical, you know, the computer tech side of it is not something I could really comment on where it comes down to servers and whatever else you need to, to make it happen. But the, but the thing where you wouldn't benefit from that is because you wouldn't get the traffic of others, you see? So... Mm-hmm. When you have when you have millions of people accessing Tidal or, or iTunes or Spotify or whatever it be, you you will only have your die-hard fans checking out your streaming website, as opposed to being able to, for example, then okay, if if someone is a fan of mine, perhaps by looking to check out my music, they may stumble across my nephew's song, and then therefore my nephew get exposure from that also. You get the message? So, so you kind of lack the traffic is, is where the problem may lie when it comes down to trying to do your own streaming. But it's a possibility. You can, I mean... But maybe know. there could be a reggae streaming site then to support reggae. It's possible. It's yeah. possible. So you, mm. you who, we're talking to Damon Junagong Marley from Miami. This is a top form podcast. Um, you started the Welcome to Jamrock Cruise. Tremendous success. There's word that it's already sold out for 2019. Yeah. T- tell us about that. How, how quickly did it sell out? Uh, it's, well, we've had 2019 on sale from in probably, you know, probably mid-2018. You know what I mean? Once 2018 sold out, we put 2019 on sale. So it's been on sale for quite a few months now but um about a week or two after we got off of this off of 2018 ship shortly after that 2019 sold out so it feels good man i mean you know i mean we still have about a year to go before the ship actually sails so to be <laughs> sold out so you know so to be sold out so far in advance is is great you know what i mean now looking forward to just building on that momentum and this this is before the lineup is even announced yeah, so it's, that's so right now. That's what we're really doing now. Is our priority right now is to get the lineup for 2019 together. You know, but Damon, you you don't drop albums often, and people want the albums. I for one, I've bought literally physical copies of all of your albums because I I think they will be worth something later on. Um, but you don't drop albums often. Are we gonna see Damon dropping albums more often? Seeing that that's the, that's the energy of music right now, where artists are dropping, even the greats are dropping albums over and over. Are you still going to keep your mystique according to that line <laughs> and Sony? Well, no. I would definitely like to drop some music of my own um, more often on a more regular basis. So even 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 this month, I'm going into the studio to go do some work on what is going to be my next album. So... Hopefully we can even get something finished and, and out on the road this year, if not then early next year. But definitely working toward releasing music more regularly. Um, and it's not really on purpose why I was so long in between solo projects, you know. It just so happened that I was working on a lot of other things in the meantime. I, as the years go on, I get more involved and interested in producing other artists. And I did a lot of that in between my last two projects. And I did an album with Naz, and I did one with Mick Jagger and a whole crew of people, and you know, over the song. <laughs> so, you know, but I was, I've been busy, you know what I mean? So, in that kind of case, still releasing music, not always solo material. But, as we said, though, over the next few years, I would like to release a few solo albums of my own. 
Who, who does Damon Junior Gang Marley listen to? All kind of music, man. All kind of things. Right, and that's the time you find it. Who do you listen to today? Uh, yo, I've, it, you see, to tell you the honest truth, you see, a lot of the times we end up listening to the music that we're working on. So, you know, 75% of the music when we listen happens to be a lot of the time the music that we're working on in the studio to make sure that things are right and, you know, double checking and stuff. But, but listen to the radio. So, whoever is on the radio up here, um, a song. If you want to call out a song that, that I'm a fan of that's been put out recently, is um, Coffee, Toast. Man. I like, like a tune there. Yeah, I like a tune there. Bad. <laughs> bad, bad, it's bad, number bad, one bad, this bad. week on the World Music News chart. Most true. Oh, which is right. Which is right. That's really nice. Yeah, I like her too. Um, you are one of the top, or if not the top act in reggae. Definitely the numbers speak for reggae music in particular. You're at the top of the game. Um, if you could, could make some legislative changes to how music is governed in Jamaica and the Caribbean, what would you do to, to assist in making the music more relatable? In light of this uni UNESCO designation of reggae being an intangible cultural piece of heritage? Well, I mean... Um, legislative, I don't know if I would use that word, but I mean, for me, for example, then, I definitely think the, the nice abatement act, that whole situation going on in Jamaica is something that definitely needs proper attention, you know, but I understand that you have to have respect residential zones, people have work in the morning, but Jamaica and reggae music, the culture of it means so much to our brand as brand Jamaica, that it's important to keep and nurture that music and keep that music alive. And it also feeds a lot of people. A lot of people, you know, it, a lot of people, is their living is based upon those parties that happen in the nighttime and this kind of thing, you know. So it really needs some addressing. Um, also, you know, I, I think that you still have to have venues that and places where you can have freedom of speech too. So a lot of the times when you know over the years them get really strict now about censoring artists and saying, well, you can't say this, or you can't cuss, or you can't do certain things. I'm not really too like that neither because just as we have to be free to be able to pray and pray to who we want to, we have to be free to be able to cuss who we want to and cuss when we want also. You yeah. understand? So I don't, too like, I don't like the censorship, you know, in that case. Yeah. Um, otherwise than that, I think that this, we can really, I think we should really investigate and take a page out of the K-pop movement. You know, the, the Korean government made um very direct moves toward you know um fueling their music industry and having and, and you know having themselves their music become a part of modern pop culture and it's been a big deal for them you know what i mean and when we talk about in jamaica well you know we want some support from the government toward music and this kind of thing well what exactly are we speaking about what what are the details of that and we need to kind of even look to some other places that have done that and see what worked and what didn't and, you know, what we can learn from them, you know. So it's really, really investment in the culture, which I don't think is a legislative change, like I said before, but investment into the culture is, is needed. Bujibantan just returned from his hiatus after eight to ten years in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> and and he brings back a... It brings back an, a kind of energy in, in, in reggae dancehall music that we haven't seen in a long time, you know? Everybody excited for a show coming up. It's probably the most anticipated show in a long time. Will you be on the show? Um, what's your position on Butcher Bantan, and do you think he'll be able to reintegrate himself back into reggae dancehall as the man he once was, or still is? Well, all right. A few things. So when you say hiatus, you know, hiatus, he was in jail, in prison. So, yeah, you know, like, like, you're right. <laughs> 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 That's really a high hit. <laughs> but um, I, as, as I was just saying to someone else, you know, first and foremost, Buju is someone where we know personally as a bedroom. So put aside all of the music business and the hype about him, you know, the, the concert and all of that kind of stuff. We're really just glad to say as a human being that he have found him freedom now, can be with his family 
and you know live a free life as a free man you know what i mean that is the most important thing and right now i think you know we've been away for so long you know from my perspective people can need to just kind of respect in space and give some time just like you talk about integration that that's going to take time that's you know there's nothing else except time for him to get used back to get you know reacclimatized to, to life on the outside you know what i mean so in that kind of sense we don't we just wish him all the best and all of your blessings you know will you be on the show that's I could, no i don't i don't know i don't know i haven't been i haven't been asked so i, I don't know we we'll have to make that happen um yeah and i know like three plane loads of people flying in for the show um it's a different vibe um but yeah june are gone yes hello yeah hey okay, there yeah yeah man um, i'm here yeah so we're gonna wrap up now my, my final question to you is the grammys about to happen next month, I believe, or late this month. Um, yeah. Five people on the bill, Protege, Etana, um, Shaggy, and Sting. Who else? Ziggy Marley. Mm-hmm. Um, how much is that? Four or five. Who, who are you rooting to win and, and, and why? Well, naturally, I'm going to root for my brother because he's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, that only go naturally, you know. But some people might say, you know, other people who win, because he won last year, right? So he win, you won the year, oh, you won last year, he, he won mm-hmm. the year before. Uh, what do you say mm-hmm. to those people who say, hey, you know, somebody young to win or somebody different to win? You have to be careful with this Grammys thing, because yeah, it's not, really music is not a competition. And, um, you know, somebody winning doesn't mean that somebody else has lost, you know? Mm. And... Right, and there's a lot of great music that gets put out every year, and then we reach to this point now, you get a lot of tension and a lot of, you know, unfair criticism sometimes because it becomes a race and becomes a competition. You know what I mean? A lot of yeah. good music being put out, and we're we're fans of all music, and I think whoever wins deserves to win. If Ziggy win, definitely him deserves to win. And Ziggy is somebody who has been representing our genre, you know, steadily, consistently over the years. Um, he's like, like I said, I was saying to someone else earlier, he's not always seen in Jamaica, you know what I mean? But that don't mean that he's not representing reggae music and representing Jamaica when he's out there touring and doing what he does internationally. And the man constantly stays working and constantly release music of a certain quality and integrity. And it goes without saying. So, you know what I mean? Um, like I say, if Ziggy win, he deserves a win, but I don't think it's... If, if someone else wins, I think they would have deserved to have won also. I think everyone is deserving of the opportunity to win who, is, who has been nominated. Junior Gong, it was lovely talking to you, Bridget. Maximum respect. Really insightful. This is the Top Form Podcast.